Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about continuity and one-sided limits. By now we have a pretty good intuitive understanding of how limits work and a reasonable sense of how we can evaluate them precisely. However, we haven't really worked with piecewise functions yet. In this lesson we will not only learn how to apply limits to piecewise functions, but in doing so we'll learn about some new ideas involving limits. Our exploration will deepen our understanding of what it means for a function to be continuous and also reveal the idea of a one-sided limit. And if you don't quite remember how piecewise functions work or you find them confusing, make sure you check out the lesson on piecewise functions that we did a long, long long time ago, like almost 40 lessons back, maybe even more, um, we did a lesson on piecewise functions. So if you don't have an understanding of how piecewise functions work, you probably want to check out that first because the idea of piecewise functions will wind up showing up a lot when we're working with limits and especially in this lesson. All right, let's go. First, we'll set up a motivating example so we can have some realizations pop out of this motivating example. So this example, this piecewise function example, will help lead us to some ideas. So we've got negative 1 when x is less than 0. That's the portion right here. We've got 0 when x equals 0. That's the portion right there. And we've got positive 1 when x is greater than 0. And notice how there are holes at actually equal to 0 on the top and actually equal to zero on the bottom because it jumps to the middle portion right here when it's actually at x equals zero. Okay, so notice that while f of zero exists, right, we get a value, we get f of zero equals zero, but the limit as x goes to zero does not exist, right? As we show up from the two different sides, as we come in, they don't agree, right? They don't agree with each other. So the point in the middle, f of 0 does exist, but the limit does not exist. The issue is not so much that f of x is a weird thing, right? It's not particularly weird. It's more an issue of f of x all of a sudden doing this jump, where it's doing this giant leaping around. It's jumping from one place to another. Wait a second. Jumping? That sounds familiar. The idea of moving around suddenly, breaking the graph. Long, long ago in this course, when we first learned about piecewise functions, about 40 lessons ago, we mentioned the idea of a continuous function. At the time, we lacked the formal ideas to precisely define continuity, so we intuitively defined it as being any of these three equivalent things. So all the parts of the function are connected, right? So we've got some function and everything in the function connects together. Alternatively, we can think of this as the function can be drawn without ever having to lift your pencil from the paper, right? Because if you have to lift your pencil, right, if we draw part of it, but then you have to stop here and lift your pencil to go somewhere else to keep going, well, we've got this break here, and because of that break, it means it's not continuous. And finally, there are no breaks or holes in the graph, right? We see a break pretty clearly in this where we go one way and then all of a sudden it switches to something else. But we can also see it just having a hole as being the same issue where it goes up here, but then for some reason this point is not defined and then it keeps going, right? It's continuous except for the part where it has this little hiccup in the middle which breaks continuity. At this point, we actually now have the formal background to expand on this intuitive definition of it not being connected, it not being continuous, and actually define continuity in a precise term using limits. To help us see this, we'll compare a piecewise example with a continuous function. So here's our piecewise example that we've been working with so far, and here's our good old continuous function friend, our good old friend for any time we need to pull out a random function, g of x equals x squared, good old parabola. So over here in our piecewise break, we can interpret the break in continuity, this part where it jumps, as it jumping, right? The issue with it being continuous isn't that something breaks in the function. The function is perfectly defined at every number. Any number that you put in, it knows what to go out to. But the issue is that it jumps all of a sudden. That is, at x equals 0, it doesn't go where we expect. It does not go to the place that we expect, right? Either direction we come at this thing. No matter how we look at it, we can't build an expectation. We can't build an expectation for where the next place is because there's no agreement, right? We can't agree on where we're going. Formally, when we can't have an expectation, there's no agreement on where we're going as we come from the two sides, that means that there is no limit as it goes to x to 0, right? As we get towards x to 
zero. Limit as x goes to zero does not exist because there's no agreement on the value that they're going to. There's the two sides are going to two totally different values. On the other hand, in g of x, there are no jumps. The nice thing about g of x, the nice thing about the parabola is that the function goes where we expect. It always winds up showing up where we expect. Every point is exactly where we expect that point to be. That is to say, every point always has a limit and that that point matches with that limit. All of g of x is exactly where we expect it to be. The limits and the points in the function are exactly the same thing. This is the idea that we use for continuity. We see that a break in continuity, the break in a function, is caused by the limit, our expectation, not matching up with what the function does. Formally, we say a function f of x is continuous at c, so at some location c, if f of c exists and the limit as x goes to c of f of x equals f of c. In other words, the function gives the value we expect when we evaluate it at c. The value that we expect to come out as we get close to c is exactly what the value winds up being. We expect some value and then that value turns out to actually be what it is. That idea of the limit matching what the function actually is there is what it means for something to be continuous at a point. Expanding on this idea, we have more vocabulary, just ways to talk about this thing. If f of x is not continuous at c, we say it is discontinuous at c, right? The opposite of continuous is discontinuous. If we want to talk about some specific location where it breaks from being continuous, we say it is a discontinuity, right? A single discontinuous point is a discontinuity. If f of x is continuous at every point in an interval, over an entire interval, it's always continuous throughout that interval, we say f is continuous on a, b, is continuous on some interval. If f of x is continuous for every real number, it's always continuous, we simply say that f is a continuous function. The function is continuous if it always winds up working out continuously. Great. Notice that the vast majority of the functions we're used to working with are continuous functions, right? When we think of functions, we usually think of these nice, smooth, curved things that all fit together quite cleanly. So when we think normal, what we're really thinking is continuous. This is why normal functions allow us to simply plug in the value we're approaching. Because we generally have a normal function, normally in our minds, means that it is a continuous function. And by definition, a continuous function is one where the limit as x goes to c of f of x is the same thing as f at c, that we can just plug in the c for our x and we will wind up getting the same thing as if we looked at the limit. The expectation is where we actually come out to be. Furthermore, this idea also explains why a function that is weird in one place still allows us to plug in the value we're approaching if it's not in the weird value. Because if it's not the weird value, then that means that it is normal in that area, or more accurately, it is continuous in that place if it's not the weird place. And because it's continuous in that place, that means we still have the same thing, that the limit as x goes to c of f of x will match with f of c. That means that we can find out what the limit is by simply plugging in c into our function. So the same logic is what we can apply here and we wind up seeing that as long as it's normal in this region around c, as long as there's some tiny little neighborhood around c that behaves normally, which is to say continuously, we can just plug c in and we will wind up being able to figure out, ah, that's what the limit comes out to be. Let us return to our motivating example now that we have the notion of continuity under our belts. Back to our motivating example, so we've got negative 1 when x is less than 0, 0 when x equals 0, and 1 when x is greater than 0. So on the one hand, as we approach 0, we totally don't have a limit, right? As x goes to 0, it does not produce a limit because yeah, they don't agree, right? If they don't agree, it's not a limit. Both sides have to agree. However, if we were to imagine only approaching from a single side, Oh, all of a sudden it starts to work. We could find limits. This realization leads us to the creation of a new type of limit, the one-sided limit, right? If we approach only from the negative side, it's clear that we're headed to negative one. If we were to approach only from the positive side, it's clear that we'd be headed to positive one. So we can have this idea of a one-sided limit where we just look at approaching from one side or the other. We don't worry about what the other side is doing. We just worry about what is this side doing? What is this side doing? Where is it headed towards as we stay coming from this one direction? A one-sided limit basically works just the same as a normal limit, except it only considers one side. So it's only looking at one side. The limit as x goes to c with a negative symbol in the top right, so our c that we're going to, and then a negative symbol in the top right, denotes the limit as x approaches c from the left 
or the negative side equivalently. It is the limit as x goes to c while x is less than c. So as x remains less than c, that is as we come from the left side, as we come from the negative side, that is the limit that we wind up getting. Limit x goes to c with that little negative sign in the corner. Similarly, if we have limit x goes to c with a positive sign in the corner, that denotes the limit as x approaches c from the right or positive side, right? As we come from the right side, the positive side. And that's going to be all of the x's where x is greater than c. So as our x stays above c, what are we going towards? Be careful to keep track of which symbol goes with which side. They're easy to get confused at first, so be careful about this. Remember, the negative symbol means look at the negative side. And positive means look at the positive side, right? If we say x goes to c with a negative symbol in that top right corner, that means we're saying look as we come from the left side. Look as we come from the negative side. If it's x goes to c with a positive sign in that top right corner, we're saying look what happens as we come from the right side, as we come from the positive side. All right, let's see this idea applied to our example. So we've got negative 1 when x is less than 0. So as we go in from the left side, limit as x goes to 0 with a negative sign, we get negative 1 because that's the value we appear to be approaching. If we come from the positive side, the limit as x goes to 0 from the positive side, we wind up approaching positive 1. If we just straight up evaluate what is f at 0, we get just simply 0. Zero. Now notice, there's not necessarily any connection. There's not necessarily any connection between the left, right side, or the actual value of what the function is, right? What, negative 1 is totally different than 0, is totally different than positive 1. The limits, the two side limits, they don't agree, and the actual value that comes out of the function, it doesn't agree with either of them. So each thing can behave totally independently. However, one connection is the two different side limits, they don't agree. And because they don't agree, that means there can't be a normal limit, the limit of it coming from both sides. For there to be a normal limit, they have to match up. If they don't match up, then that means there's no normal limit. So matching up, if the left and right side match up together, if the two sides match up together, that means we do have a normal limit. If on the other hand they don't match up, then that means we don't have a normal limit. So normal limits and one-sided limits, if w both sides of a function, so if both sides of a function go to the same value as some location is approached, then the normal limit exists there. Furthermore, if a normal limit exists, then both sides must go to the same value as they approach that location. Symbolically, we can write this as the left side limit equals L, and the right side limit equals L implies that the normal limit is equal to L as well, right? If our left side goes to the same value as our left side, then that, sorry, if our left side goes to the same value as our right side, then that means the sides match up, so we have a normal limit, and because they both went to L, then we come out as a L limit, a limit going to L. Similarly, if we went the other direction, if we know that, hey, there's a limit here at L, then that means if we went off to the left side or we went off to the right side, we're going to wind up having it be L both of those directions as well. So if the limit exists, if the normal limit exists, then we know that the left side limit and the right side limit, the negative limit and the positive limit, have to both be equal to the same thing. They have to be equal to this same L. All right. Continuing with the same idea, if both one-sided limits do not go to the same value, that is, they not, don't match up or one of them simply doesn't exist at all, then a normal limit does not exist there. That is to say, if the limit, the left side limit, is not the same as the right side limit, then that means that the limit, the normal limit, does not exist. And if the normal d limit does not exist, that tells us that one of them has to not exist or that one of the sides must not match up, the sides don't match up to each other, right? So there's this connection between normal limits and one-sided limits. If the one-sided limits meet up together, there's a normal limit at that place. If there's a normal limit at that place, then that means the one-sided limits must match up together. And same thing, if the one-sided limits don't match up, then that means there is no normal limit. If there is no normal limit, then we can't have matching up. Great. All right. Uh, limits of piecewise functions, we're now ready to actually talk about how to apply all this stuff to a piecewise function. It's this idea, this idea about do they match up, do they not match up, that lets us find the limits of a piecewise function at a breakover point. So a breakover point is switching from one function to another function, right? We're going here and then 
all of a sudden we come out as some other thing. Let's see what we're talking about here. So we're some function here, and then all of a sudden we swap over to being some other function like this, right? So I'm talking about this breakover place being where it switches between the two. So if it's a breakover point and we want to evaluate this, well, we can say, hey, where were you going from the left side? Where were you going from the right side? And we can ask questions about each of the one-sided limits and how they relate to each other. And if it's not a breakover point, then we don't have to worry about that because that normally means that we're just in the middle of a normal, nice, continuous part of a piecewise function. And that means we can usually just plug the location in as we discussed in the previous lesson and as we sort of discussed earlier in this lesson, right? If you're in the middle of a nice continuous chunk of a function, yeah, you just plug in the location that you're going to because continuous means that the limit matches up with what it evaluates to be there. So if we do have a piecewise function though and we're looking at a breakover where we switch from one track to another track, then we can find the limit of a piecewise function. We can find the limit of a piecewise function by checking if left and right side limits agree. If the left side and the right side agree with each other, then that means that we have a limit there. So if they agree, the limit exists and it's equal to what they both are, right? Because they have to match up to the same value. If they do not agree, right, one goes here, the other one goes here, then there's a jump between them, which means that there can't be a normal limit because we have to agree from both sides. Then the limit does not exist. Since piecewise functions are usually made up of fairly normal functions, you don't really normally see any very weird functions when we're dealing with piecewise functions. So since each side's normally fairly normal, it's normally pretty easy to find the left and right side of limits when we want to compare them because we can just say, okay, if we plugged in for the, you know, plug in for the left side over here, plug in for the right side over here, we're able to figure out, oh, that was what the left side limit is, that's what the right side limit has to be. Now do whether or not they actually match up. So you can normally pretty easily figure out what they are. All right, let's see some examples. First example, find both of the one-sided limits below for f of x equals negative 3x plus 3 when x is less than 2, and x squared plus 2 when x is greater than or equal to 2. So first, let's just see a quick drawing, quick sketch to get some handle on how this thing works. So negative 3x plus 3 when x is less than 2. So negative 3x plus 3, we're going to wind up being in a fairly steep incline like this, and then it pops out of existence here. Right, because now we hit x is less than 2, and then we switch over to some x squared plus 2, x is greater than or equal to, so at x squared plus 2, we would pop up here, and then we would continue on our way with whatever the parabola is already in motion. Right, so that's what we're seeing from this piecewise function. So when it says the limits below for x going to 2 from the negative side, well, if we're from the negative side, we're looking about what's happening as we come in here. So if we're looking at what's coming in here, and that's x less than 2, which means we're just concerned about negative 3x plus 3. So if that's the case, then that means limit as x goes to 2 from the left side is just if we plugged in negative 3x plus 3, so we plug in 2, it's 2 from the left side, we plug in 2, negative 3 to, uh, times 2 plus 3, negative 6 plus 3, so we get 3. Oops, sorry, not 3, but negative 3 there. Sorry about that. Negative 3. Over here, if we want to talk about limit as x goes to 2 from the positive side, then what we're concerned about is we come in from this side. So as we come in from this side, we belong to x being greater than or equal to 2. We don't actually have to worry about the x equals 2 because they're both limits, so it's only the journey towards that location. So we use x squared plus 2 if we want to talk about what it's going to be. x squared plus 2 is nice and normal until that flip over, so we can just plug into that. So x squared plus 2 means it's going to be 2 squared plus 2, 4 plus 2, or 6. And that's what we get for our two different sides for the limits here. Notice that they don't match up. All right, second example. Evaluate the limit as x goes to 3 from the positive side of x minus 3 plus 4. First, let's just quick draw a quick sketch so we can see what's going on here. So x goes to 3. X, sorry. Square root of x minus 3 plus 4. So where would that start? Well, the first value that would make sense in there, right, if we plug in anything less than 3, we're going to be taking the square root of a negative number, so we can't be any less than 3. So the very first point we could plot is at positive 3, then we'd have 4 come out of it. And then we'd curve out like a square root function like this. 
Okay, so if we're concerned about x going to 3 from the positive side, then what we care about is what happens on our way there. So in our way there, it winds up just behaving like square root of x minus 3 plus 4, right? It's totally normal up until the moment where it stops existing completely when we try to take square roots of negatives. So the limit as x goes to 3 from the positive side, square root of x minus 3 plus 4, well, since it behaves totally normally up until the point where it stops, stops existing, but we don't care about that side because we're on the existing side, right? The three positive side. So we can just plug in our value for three. So square root of three minus three plus four, square root of zero plus four or positive four. And that totally makes sense, right? The point that we expect to go to is this one right here where it starts off. There's no weird jumps. There's nothing weird going on as we go in. As we come in, you know, as we come in from the positive side, as we come in from the positive side, it's very clearly headed towards 4. So it makes total sense that it has a limit. Now, what about explain why the limit as x goes to 3 of square root of x minus 3 plus 4 does not exist? Well, the real thing here is, does it come into the same thing from both sides? No, because there's nothing over here at all, right? If we try to come in from the left side, what's going on? We have no idea what's going on. That's why it does not exist. If we want to get even more formally, well, we can say that for the limit as x to go to 3 to exist, that must mean that the limit as x goes to 3 from the positive side is the same thing as limit as x goes to 3 from the negative side. But clearly, the limit as x goes to 3 from the negative side of f of x this being f of x in this case, does not exist, right? You can't say that it's something we're headed towards because it just doesn't exist in that area. If it doesn't exist as we try to come in from the left side, since it doesn't exist as we try to come in from the left side, there's no limit to say it's going to. So if the right side simply does not exist, then that means the normal limit can't exist because we've only got one half of a normal limit. So therefore, the limit as x goes to 3 does not exist. And that's why we see that. But more informally, it's just the fact that we can't see it coming to the same thing from both sides. We have to have it from both sides. So if one side simply just isn't there, then it doesn't exist. Third example, determine if the limit exists. If so, evaluate it. So we've got a piecewise function here, right? x cubed plus 4, x less than negative 1, 7 when x is equal to negative 1, and quantity x minus 1 squared minus 1 when x is greater than negative 1. So our first question is, where are we headed towards? We're headed to x going to negative 1. Ah, so we don't just have it being in a nice, convenient, normal section. We are going exactly smack dab in the breakover. All right, well, if that's the case, how do we check to make sure it exists? Well, it only exists if from the right side and the left side, it meets up to the same value, right? The two different sided limits have to go agree with each other. So if that's the case, what we're looking for is the limit as x goes to negative 1 of f of x is going to be based on the limit as x goes to negative 1 from the negative side. And don't get confused about the negative 1 and then the negative. The negative in the top right tells us that we're coming from the negative side. The negative in the normal place just means it's a negative number. Is going to be the same thing as the limit as x goes to negative 1 from the positive side. If they wind up being the same value for the limit, then we wind up getting that it does exist as an actual limit and it is that location. First thing to notice at this point is, do we care about 7 when x equals negative 1? No, we don't care about it because it's x goes to negative 1. And remember, it's about the journey, not the destination. It's about where you're headed, but you don't actually care about where you show up when you're looking at a limit. You just care about where it seemed like you were going to. So where we actually wind up going doesn't matter. 7, we don't have to worry about that at all. It's just there's a red herring to get us confused. The only things that we really have to care about is the x cubed plus 4, the part that we're coming from the left side, right? x less than negative 1, and the quantity x minus 1 squared minus 1, the part that we're coming from the positive side because it's x greater than negative 1. So if that's the case, let's work this out. We know that our left side, our left side limit will be based off of x cubed plus 4. So that the limit as the limit as x goes to negative 1 from the negative side of f of x will be the same as if we had simply plugged in negative 1 for our x 
here since we're coming from the left side and x cubed plus 4 is the way the thing behaves as long it is as it is on the left side of negative 1. So we plug into there, we've got negative 1 cubed plus 4. Negative 1 cubed is just negative 1 plus 4, so we get positive 3. Positive 3 from the left side. Switch to looking at our right side now. The question is, do the two sides agree or do they disagree? If they go to different places, then the limit does not exist. If they go to the same place, then they do exist and the limit is where they meet up. So in this case, we're now looking at the right side function is x minus 1 squared minus 1. So we're looking at the limit as x comes in from the right side, that is the positive side of f of x. So once again, all we're concerned with is the right side of this, and the right side is entirely determined by this function because that's how the right side is behaving that whole time, just as the left side was behaving the whole time from x cubed plus 4. So it's just a question of how will that fit into there because x minus 1 squared minus 1 is a nice continuous function, so we can just plug into it because we don't have to worry about anything weird happening. So we plug into that, and we've got quantity negative 1 swap out for our x minus 1 squared minus 1 negative 2 inside of there, squared, minus 1. So that gets us 4 minus 1, which gets us 3. Hey, look at that. 3 and 3 check out. So that means, indeed, the limit does exist. So thus, we can combine these two things, and we know that since the left and right side limits, they agreed with each other, they both came out to be 3, that means the limit as x approaches negative 1 from both sides of f of x is equal to 3. I do want to point out to you, though, f of x is not continuous. Why? Because at x equals negative 1, it jumps. So the left side expects to go to 3, the right side expects to go to 3, but when we actually get to 3, it jumps up to 7. So because it jumps to somewhere else, it's not continuous. The limit exists, but it's not actually a continuous function. It has to have a limit and agree with what that point actually comes out to be to be continuous. All right, our final one, where we do actually talk about continuity. Determine the value of a that makes f of x continuous. So to be continuous, what does it mean to be continuous? And I will write that out as CTS, just because I'm lazy. To be continuous, that means that the limit as x goes to c of f of x is equal to f of c. Remember, we talked about this as the expectation for the function is the same thing as what we actually get out of the function. That's what it means for something to be continuous. So the expectation, the limit, is the same thing as what we actually get out f of c. So to be continuous, the limit as x goes to c of f of x must be equal to f of c. However, in this case, we don't just have to worry about limits. We also have to worry about the fact that this is a piecewise function. So since it's a piecewise function, we need to make sure that both of the pieces wind up agreeing. So first question is, does the limit exist? So, well, our question here, to be continuous, the limit is, the function will be continuous if the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x is equal to f at 1. All right, so that's the case. So what is f at 1? We'll come back to the left side and the right side in just a second. So what is f at 1? Well, f at 1 is equal to... 5 minus, oh, which one do we have to use? We use x is less than or equal to 1, so we're using this guy right here. So 5 minus 2, we swap out the x for a 1, minus swap out the x for a 1 squared. 5 minus 2 minus 1, 5 minus 2 minus 1 comes out to be 2. So f of 1 comes out to be 2. Great. All right. Now, what we need to figure out is we need to figure out, does the limit exist there? So if our limit's going to exist, we've got two different sides that we're coming from, right? We're coming from the left side and we're coming from the right side. We're coming from the less than or equal and the greater than. So we've got both a left and right side that we have to make sure match up. So since we've got two different possibilities, we have to make sure the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x has to be is the same thing as saying, right, because we have to check that both sides match, that the limit as x goes to 1 from the negative side is equal to the limit as x goes to 1 from the positive side. Now we have to make sure that they're the same, and they should, of course, both be f of x in here. 
Right, we're talking about f of x this whole time. So the limit as x goes to negative it goes to 1 from the negative side. Well, actually, we already figured out what is the limit as x goes to 1 from the negative side. Well, that's going to be based off of how this guy works because he is the left side, right? x less than or equal to 1, it behaves like 5 minus 2x minus x squared. So if you're less than, you're the negative side, so it behaves just like 5 minus 2x minus x squared. So 5 minus 2x minus x squared, we already figured out what happens there. That comes out to be 2, right? Since we're behaving just on the left side, that's just like it's going towards 2. So we know that this is going to be, come out to be 2. So really, our only question is, does this part here equal the limit as x goes to 1 from the positive side? So we are allowed to determine ax minus 1. We can't change x because that's just a variable, but a, we we're supposed to determine the value of a that will make this whole thing continuous. So we know 2, because that's what the limit as x goes to 1 from the negative side, has to be equal to ax minus 1. ax minus 1, what x are we going to? We're going to 1 from the positive side, so we just use ax minus 1. So we plug in 1 for our x minus 1. Start working that out. We've got 2 equals a minus 1. We add 1 to both sides. We have 3 equals a. So 3 must be equal to a. And if 3 is equal to a, then that means that the limit on the right side is equal to the limit on the left side, which means that the limit does exist and that the limit will come out to be 2. And since the limit comes out to be 2 and we know that f of 1 equals 2, we now see, yes, it is indeed continuous. It might be a little bit hard to understand what's going on, so it can really help to see this graphically. So let's draw a quick picture just to cement our understanding. That's how you do it technically, but it's really useful to understand what's going on intuitively as well. So our 5 minus 2x minus x squared, that would graph basically like this. And when we get to x less than or equal to 1, we jump over to the other one. Now, since it's ax minus 1, a, well, a is taking the position of the slope, right? mx plus b is how we normally graph a thing, graph a line. So mx minus 1 means that we are shifted down 1. We're definitely going to have a point there of down 1 on the y-axis. But our a, we are allowed to choose our value of a. So what we're doing is we're effectively choosing the slope that we're going to have. So that means we get to choose some possibility for our slope. So we have any possible rotation of this line. right? So all of the different lines that could go through here with various different slopes are all the different possibilities. So the one that we have to choose to make this thing come out to be continuous is where that line matches up to where we sort of have this handoff, where we have this breakover point. So we choose the one that matches up, we choose that slope, and it continues out from here. And that way, we wind up having the breakover winds up changing to a new track, but that track starts in the same place. We've chosen the slope so that the line matches up with where the other one finished off and it goes through. Great. All right. So that finishes up. We now have got an understanding of how to deal with piecewise, uh, piecewise functions. It's basically a question of does the left side and right side, do the left side and right side, one-sided limits, do they match up to each other? And if we're talking about continuity, it's a question of does the limit match what comes out of it? And sometimes it will become a question of do the two sides match what comes out of it? All right. That finishes up for this lesson. We'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.